I wanted to introduce uh, Tom. Some of, uh, most of all of you probably know him in relationship to the ministry that he uh, was in charge of at uh, PCC. And so anyway, um, um, a couple of years ago, uh, when we did the Reimagine co Conference, uh, we had um, people from all, all over, and I asked uh, Tom to, uh, at that time, to be to share with us what they were doing with PCC was online, and that was about three years ago. And then uh, in the meantime, um, um, he's just walking by faith. He left the computer world to be able to be with PCC and um, do all their online stuff. And he built that into a very sizable ministry. And then uh, recently, Tom, how long ago was it? November. Uh, November of this past year, I uh, turned around and... Uh, again, decided to make another move for the sake of the of uh, starting a ministry like this. So I uh, asked him to be able to uh, come uh, to you all and give you ideas that he's had as he's, he's, he's very humble. And he's not going to tell you this, but he really is in contact with people all across the country who are uh, doing this in, in large, large measures. So Tom, I'm going to uh, let you go ahead and take it uh, away from here. And uh, we're recording this so that you all will know. And then um, if it's all right, Tom, would you feel comfortable for them to ask questions as you go? Or would you prefer for them to be more towards the end? I, I am very comfortable with people asking questions as we go, because as I hit different topics, there'll be things that you want clarity on. Uh, and then, of course, we'll still, if need be, there'll still be time at the end okay. uh, to have a Q&A session. That sounds good. All right. Appreciate it. Take it away. All right. Uh, so thank you all for being here today. I appreciate everyone coming. Um, and I will make one promise that hopefully I will be uh, not getting too fast on my script and uh, moving through this too quickly. So, but please, yes, if you have questions, please, uh, please chime in and ask them. So as Jim introduced, uh, I am the online campus pastor and director of IT for a Passion Community Church here in Palatine, Virginia. And uh, when I came on board, uh, the campus, I'll call it a campus, it really wasn't a campus at the time, uh, but we had on average about 20 or 30 people connecting and watching on a Sunday morning, which in and of itself, not bad. Um, but over the course of the five and a half years while I was there, we were able to grow that ministry to the point that by the time I left, we were averaging between 1,500 and 2,000 viewers joining us online every Sunday. Uh, we had people from all over the continental U.S. as well as overseas. Uh, we had Portugal and um, Lord, I'm drawing a blank on some of them already, but we had about three or four other countries where people would chime, would connect in and watch us every Sunday. And we had, uh, we had a, a multitude of venues of which people could join us through. And some of those I'll touch on as we go through what I have got worked up for my, uh, my conversation today. Um, but uh, taking the online campus, the online presence from a, a small HD uh, camera sitting at the back of the room and whatever the sound mix was coming from the PA system in the main sanctuary to having a, a, a and to having a full-blown think of it this way a full-blown small television broadcast station is in essence what we create um, not everybody needs to go to that level you can over time uh, and, and raise the bar to a level that uh, just helps your congregation grow. But one of the things I'm going to stress in our conversations today is just because I took it to this level at PCC does not mean that's where it needs to be for, your, for you and your church. You want to tailor this to fit your church, your congregation, and the mission that your church has. So there's any level that we can we can talk about where this reaches uh, as far as interaction. But I'm just right off the bat, I'm going to go ahead with uh, a presentation that I kind of worked up. Um, so you know, one of the biggest things that everybody here is definitely going to be able to to uh, understand and to, uh, 
comprehend and, and feel uh, the presence of is COVID-19. Uh, everyone had their online presence or they had no online presence before COVID. They had physical attendance in church and, and you know, for the phrase that I always used was, you know, butts in the seats was the scenario that we had at the time. And that was our measure. That was how we built services. That's how we prepared for Sunday morning, knowing that we would have people sitting in the seats. Um, COVID-19 it, and we all had to learn a new game. And some of y'all have done an amazing job learning that new game. Um, it, jumping in, figuring out how to use platforms like Zoom, uh, YouTube, Live, you know, Premiere, uh, all of that, even down to, uh, I know a m number of you have gone and done your, your paid for streaming services. You've added cameras to be able to stream. You've embedded it on your web, on your web page. Um, but we've all learned that to stay abreast of the, of the congregation, to stay connected with them, to keep them involved, you had to move to a digital platform. So one of the conversations I frequently have had is people will say, I am waiting for the day we get back to pre-COVID. And my answer always is there is no going back to pre-COVID. Um, we will start having more and more as everybody immunity builds up, everybody gets vaccinated. We will have physical campuses again uh, where we have people in the seats, uh, but your, your need for an online presence is going to be more important going forward. Because as, as our society continues, as our congregations age and we work towards bringing in newer members to the congregation, your society is typically going to say, hey, I don't necessarily want to go sit in a pew or a chair and check this church out that way. I want to go online and see what they're all about. So that's why I stress, I always push that you need to be a physical church with a digital presence to help communicate what you're about. Um, you know, it, in the days of only having a physical presence, people would come in, sit down. The greeter at your front door was your absolute first impression. Um, now it's your online presence and what people see online and what they can do online. More, everybody is focused in today's world as um, video on demand, basically, if you take that approach. I mean, I know my wife and I watch Amazon Prime and Netflix and things like that as we, as we want to. The, that mindset is kind of there in our society today. They want to be able to see what you're about. So that's why I strongly will strongly always press that you want to look at your digital presence as the online version of your church, your congregation and what you're trying to do and not just limit it to just the physical. Uh, it, it's uh, a, a huge connection to be able to say, check us out online, come see us. You know, those kinds, that kind of approach is in today's society is just huge. Uh, one of the things that um, was a project I had started before I left PCC and, and started this business. And it's something that yeah, I've held kind of close to my heart. And I think everyone here is definitely going to have that how do you deal with individuals who are shut-ins or for whatever reason, they just cannot make it to physical church. Your online presence can be a huge tool for that. Um, down to if you're streaming your services online, then obviously they're capable of having that access point to, to still be part of church, to still be engaged in the congregation, to still be fed the word uh, by your church. So we focus it on how do we, how do we make changes to what we're currently doing? So one of the things that I wanted to suggest, and I've started suggesting this in a lot of my meetings, just about every church I've been to has some form of a care team, uh, be it a small group or a larger group. Some of them have combined in with like meals, uh, meals on wheels, 
you know, you, you go and you check in on those folks who are hospital bound. Your pastoral care also happens a lot through those channels. If you were to think about teaming up your care team with your student and youth ministries and start training up your student and youth to help take care of your shut-ins or those not able to be in physical church, you could accomplish so many different things with that. More technically savvy than most of us. So, you know, I, I find it easy to pair uh, a member of the youth and student ministries and say, I've got this individual who is homebound. Uh, he cannot make it to church. Go check on him, go visit him go over whatever technical issues he may have as far as being able to stream or listen to services. That opens up a whole window of opportunity for you to look at either do, or, or do, they, have, uh, do they have the technical equipment? Do they have a laptop, an iPad, anything that will connect to the internet so they can be part of it? Um, I have a, a church that I've been talking to, and I think their idea was awesome. I don't know why I didn't think about it. They have started to sing as they come across them, low-cost tablets, iPads, you know, anything that's like on sale, and repurposing them and loading them up with this right software and giving them to their shut-ins and saying, here, you can use this. So all they got to do is turn it on and hit a button, and then they're connected to church. Um, along those lines, this is where your youth and students can help out by saying, hey, we can come on a routine schedule and make sure you got what you need. You know, if you've got some, some, you know, some assistance you need, I can help you with your technology. I can help you with a visit, just an outright visit in and of itself, as we all know, for your shut-ins is, is huge. And so it allows you to expand your care team and allows you to really focus on your shut-ins and for those individuals individuals to remain connected to the church. Uh, before leaving PCC, I had one individual, uh, let me rephrase it, I actually had two individuals. I had one who was bedridden. She could not uh, leave her house. And, but she was online. She was active online. She just physically could not leave her house. And she was an online chat host for me. She would be involved with us. Um, you know, then I had another who, uh, just to share one more story, I had another lady who frequently would email or text me because in this individual I had gotten to know, I gave her my personal phone, that's the number I said here, text me, I will chat anytime. And she was, she was not homebound as much as her husband was. Uh, and her husband was also suffering from dementia. And so she was his full-time caregiver. And we became her full-time care support by giving her a connection, giving her a channel to talk to someone, to make sure that she had what she needed. Did she need the support of the church? Did we need to run food by? Those kinds of things. All of this are aspects of, it's not just your caring and business and hospital anymore. You can use your online presence, your social medias to really link all of this together and say, hey, our church is here for you. We have different folks we can utilize to send to you. Um, the one thing that I always, that I started, um, and I will apologize because at the moment I'm drawing a blank on the name of the software. Um, it was a software that I had per that I was per getting ready to purchase before leaving PCC, and at the time it was called uh, Care Notebook. It's now changed, and I want to say I think it's Note Bird. I'll have to look that one up, and I can send you that later if you want to have it. But if you look up the former name of it, it's Care Notebook. It's a web-based software for pastoral care, and it allows you and to have a team of folks to keep track of such and such went to visit this person at this time and date. This is what we talked about. Here's is what they need. They can, and you can set tasks and you know, repeat schedules 
to help you keep track of who was the last person, what's been happening with this person, you know, how can we continue to take care of them? And uh, so it huge benefit uh, to be able to use that information. Um, and, and like I said before, dealing with this particular area, you really have to tie in a lot of pieces to really take advantage of it uh, between adding social media. Um, thank you, Bob. Notebird. I could not remember. Um, it just, it, it, it's just a huge opportunity to continue to grow. One, one small side effect of doing this for those people who are shut-ins you will build a relationship, not only with them, you will build it with their family. Even if that particular, if those family members don't attend your, your church, they will recognize the fact of, look what this church did for my loved one. Look how they are connected. How, look how they are committed to help us. And we had a couple individuals who didn't even live in our state, but they started chiming in every Sunday online because of what we did for their, their family member who was a shut-in. So I know I touched on a lot with that one. And, I, and I, again, I apologize if I'm going too fast and throwing stuff out there. Um, but there's so many aspects to this, it's kind of hard to cover them all with, without you know, looking at every little facet. I just wanted to make sure I stressed for you the fact that you know, online ministry it does not have to be just what you're sending out on Sunday morning or in the middle of the week. It doesn't have to be um, like we did at PCC. It doesn't have to be daily worship or your midweek worship. It's, it's a tool. It's a 24 seven presence of your church. And in that aspect, your church never closes. It's always open. If you have your online presence, focus on what are what are the areas that online ministry can advance your church and its ministry? Um, so before I dive too further, any, any questions or comments on that one? Thank you all for the finding the information on the note bird. That's uh, that was helpful. Yeah. Go ahead. Bob um, do you have any ideas how to connect shut-ins who currently are not using the internet ah. are there ways of, getting them up to speed on that. Right, I actually am, uh, I will go ahead and address that here, but I will touch on it again a little bit later in my notes. Um, we've, I've had to deal with that as well because you you can have, all right, so for those who, who do know or don't know PCC, we were a multi-site church. So we had campuses and uh, we had a couple campuses in very rural areas and um, internet connection was difficult at best for some of those folks. Um, what we, what we did twofold, twofold answer to your question. So what we did for, for those, for those particular campuses, we looked at live streaming our services over the phone. There's, there's a service or two out there now called phone live streaming, that phone line streaming.com, uh, relatively inexpensive, very easy to use. Uh, you can live stream or you can uh, load up an audio file to be played uh, either when someone calls in or at a specific time. It's very flexible software. I would definitely suggest it. Now, it is not high quality. So don't think it's going to be like you're getting this HD audio file and it's going to sound like, you know, something come on off your radio station. But it definitely provides that link, that channel availability. For those folks who don't, um, who are shut-ins, who don't have internet, who potentially don't even have the technology, um, that's where I was discussing the whole fact of pairing your youth and students and your care team together, looking at something like getting those iPads, you know, because you can go out and get refurbished iPads and tablets, relatively inexpensive now. It's still an investment, but still in the grand scheme, it's inexpensive. You could then team up with that care team and add, um, like uh, they may not get it live for Sunday morning, but you could load up the recording of services, which means you would your care team would need to visit them once a week or once every two weeks, and then they get a, a week or two weeks of services. 
it's still a way to get them connected. Um, it, it still comes down to what your church's capability is for investment. You know, how much can we invest to, to go and help these folks? Um, I know I had one individual, and this was an exception. We didn't communicate this, that we did this publicly, but I did have one person who they couldn't get internet. They wanted to be connected. We, uh, we, fed, we found out that they could get like cellular hotspot in their area. So we invested for this one individual um, through a couple of people at the church who, who donated them funds for this. We invested and bought them like a Verizon hotspot that they could use to be able to stay connected at a church. Now that's a one-off, but I mean, you can look into things like that. Um, to be able to have those folks connected. I, I leaned more to tablets and uh, even some older refurbished laptops that you could have someone pay a visit, load the files for them to be able to watch. Um, you know, that way you still have that, that channel, that connection. Anyone else? All right, so one of the area, the next little area I was gonna talk on was um, Mainly, let's say this is going to be for whether you are live streaming or you're pre-recording your services. Um, there's a lot of people who are doing pre-records now, mainly because you can control what's, I hate using that phrase, but you can control the quality of what you're putting out there by doing a pre-record and scheduling it to play. Live streaming has been my personal favorite. I prefer live streaming. I've, I've always felt live streaming was more authentic. Um, so if there's a screw up, hey, there's a screw up, but hey, it's Sunday morning. You could have that whether you're sitting in the chair in the room or watching it on, on the television. So, um, but whether you're live streaming or pre-recording, one of the uh, pieces that I had to work with our leadership, not that they fought me on this, it's just, a matter of training, let's put it that way. You know, the, our leadership, when they got on the stage, our senior pastor, he had trained himself over the years to make sure he was looking around the room, making eye contact as he's preaching uh, with the different, different people in the room, which is excellent. You, and you, you should do that. But what I had to train them to do was to take that one extra little step and make eye contact with the camera because they had spent so much time being taught not to look at the camera. And I was like, I'm not sure who told you that you need to look at the camera, <laughs> you know? And so a visual that I presented to them that seemed to work is I'll present that here. I'm like, all right. So think about like Easter Sunday, Christmas Eve, almost every church is full to the gills on those. You usually have people sitting in overflow rooms somewhere be it the atrium, North X, whatever other room you have, 30, 40, 50 people sitting in the atrium watching you just on the other side of that wall on big screens on the television. You need to look at the camera to talk to those people out there because they're here. Same concept, whether the people are in the other room, across the country, across the world, you are making eye contact with those folks, just like I'm doing right now with you on this. You make eye contact with the camera, People feel engaged, they feel connected, they feel part of what's happening. Whereas if you don't, and you're just looking at the people in the room, it's kind of like walking up to a window and seeing what's happening in the church building. You know, you don't quite feel the same connection. So little thing like making eye contact. And of course, you know, I always had to explain to, I'm like, I'm not saying you look at the camera only and you don't look around the room. You need to balance that. You need to look around the room, look at the camera, you know, because they're with you, you know, whether, again, whether you are recording it for broadcast later or you're live, definitely when you're live, obviously. Um, but that also translates into a couple of other small areas to tweak when you are doing your uh, videos for, like I said, live or pre record. Um, developing how you communicate during that recording or during that stream is important on how you say certain things. Cause 
what you're going to do, what most everyone is doing, is you're taking a recording of that event and you're posting it for viewing later. So the one thing I, I always had to stress was when you come on stage, as, as was always the practice in, in any church I've sat in, good morning, welcome to church, we're glad you're here. Or good evening, thank you for coming to our night service, however. So I always stress the fact that that little phrase is, is called time stamping. And if you timestamp something, when people go back to watch it, they understand they are watching something that happened at another time. But if you change those phrases and leave out the good morning, good evening, welcome to church, we're glad you're here. It feels more like this is happening right now. And it's a tiny little thing, a tiny little thing, but it changes how people engage with your video. It feels more personable. It feels more connected. And people will start to watch your services post and realize, you know what? This is, this is what it's like when I'm sitting there. This is what it's like when they're live. It just, those little things like that make a huge difference. So small verbal changes on how you speak to the camera, how you do doing your recordings are important. And you just kind of have to really think through it, think through it from the aspect of the person sitting on the other side of that camera. What, what are they seeing? What are they hearing? How do they feel? How would I feel if I was that person and I said this? You can drive yourself crazy if you dig into it too deep. So, you know, little steps, it's, it's, it, it'll work. Um, the other tidbit in this area that, uh, and I'm, I'm a rather OCD kind of character, for those of you who don't know me. Um, so I frequently would run in to our sanctuary. And, and at some point, the pastor and I would joke about it. But there were many times he wanted to lock the doors and keep me out of the main sanctuary because I would go in and say, hey, that water bottle needs to go off the stage. Hey, that guitar stand doesn't need to be right there. Can we move it left or right? You know, paying attention to what is in the background of your camera shot or in the foreground of your camera shot is very important. Um, I have an example I, I have, and, and I called this pastor later on, and he and I told him what I, my viewpoint, and he started laughing, and he goes, you're absolutely right. I didn't think about that. But he sent me a video. They were getting ready to do pre-records, and they were getting ready to start broadcasting through pre-records, and he sent me a video to critique for him. And I told him, I'm like, y'all have done a great job. I said, there's only one thing that is critically a problem with your video content's excellent, you know, uh, given the fact that you're just starting out, it's not like you're going to have a big studio budget for cameras and studio lighting and all this stuff. It was a small church and they had like one camera and a couple of lights and that was it. But the pastor filmed his message standing in front of a four foot diameter clock. And the entire time, all you could see was the hand of the clock moving behind him and I'm like, that is so distracting because you already have problems with people who want to watch the clock. So it is important to look at background, foreground, and make sure that the focus of your video is the message or the music the work set that you're presenting. Um, it's little things that people don't even think about. And you just, you have to kind of take a second look, take a new new angle and, and really pay attention to what's going on behind you, in front of you, around you. Um, you know, uh, one last example on that. Uh, and, and for those of you who know PCC, we had Brian Hughes on stage and he was giving his sermon. And uh, we had a stagehand who, this was like his second or third Sunday being stagehand. And he got a out of time cue and walked on stage to take some things off the stage from behind Brian. And he ended up being in the live shot. And I don't know, let me phrase it this way. 
I don't know how he got away wearing the shirt he wore to church that day, but it was not appropriate for the broadcast. And, uh, and he ended up right in the shot. You just, it's those little things. So in Brian's case, he was paying attention to the surrounding. He didn't see this guy coming on stage and it was distracting. It, it really messed up the, 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 broad, the, not the broadcast, but the shot for that message. So this is where it becomes important that when you are videotaping or streaming live, that you have someone who's standing on the other side of that camera who will be playing the producer or director role. And their job is to focus on what's going on in the scene, what's around you, what's behind you, who's coming in, who's coming out. It seems like a overproduction piece, but it really makes a huge difference in, in how your videos and your recordings will turn out. And again, it goes back to uh, how your online folks interpret it. Tom, I have two questions on that, sure. um, separate questions. Mm -hmm. So the first is about making eye contact. Um, we currently operate with two cell phone cameras and I'm thrilled to say within the next month to six weeks, we're gonna be having actual actual cameras. Good. So how does, um, how does our pastor know which camera shot we are working in the tech booth to make sure when he thinks he's making eye contact, we're capturing that eye contact. So that's okay. question one. Do you want to answer it or do you mean to ask the second yeah, question? Yeah, actually, let me answer that one real quick. Okay. So I don't, lose, I don't lose my train of thought on it too. Even working at PCC where we had eight cameras, we had this problem uh, because the one thing we had not invested in was a system called a tally system. And if you, if you ever watch any news station or any you know, television broadcast type thing, every camera have, will have a little red light, light or green light, something that indicates this is the live camera. Um, they're not terribly expensive, uh, but like you just said, you only had two cell phones, so you wouldn't have had a tally lights for that. You kind of have to, you kind of, if you don't have a tally system that indicates which camera is your live camera, then you need to have scripted, almost you need to script what camera shots happening at what time so that when your pastor is on stage, he also has to then learn, in this part of my sermon, I need to look here, or in this part of my sermon, I need to look over here. Um, then the only other piece to that, and this is where PCC worked around our tally, not having a tally system, uh, we had a really, uh, I'm going to say gifted because he wasn't initially trained, but we had a very gifted camera switch operator who could follow where the speaking pastor was going and make sure he switched to the right camera. Um, so I know that's kind of an overkill question answer for you, uh, but that's, that's how we got around it. No, actually that's good because at one point we talked about, um, even magnets, a red and a green that we could put on our tripods. Mm -hmm. But but once we get these cameras mounted, that you know that goes out the window anyway. So that's really good. All right, my second question: um, We're a traditional church, and the choir sits on the platform, which means that it's very hard for me to capture a shot without at least one person sitting behind um, either Pastor Sammy or or the person reading the scripture and. You know, I continue to tell our, our music director to remind them that every time they even scratch their nose, like it's probably on video. But with COVID, it makes it harder to orchestrate getting them out of the shot because we've got to space them out. So I, I don't really even know what my direct question is, except help me figure this out right. because I always have somebody in the background of shot. All right. Well, I, I, I can definitely give you a little help there. And I'll, I'll preface my, my statement with this. Uh, I know Sammy, so anybody in the background is going to be an added benefit for you. Um, <laughs> He's going to watch this later. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. I'll be talking to him this week anyhow, so I, I'll, I'll give him I'll give him grief anyway. Um, no, I understand exactly what you're saying, and that is difficult. Um, and, and again, I can I can relate with that because even at PCC. When we were on stage, now granted during the pastor's deliverance, we didn't have, typically we didn't have anybody behind him. 
but there were plenty of times when he's either coming on stage or he comes in for an announcement type thing. We would have him on stage and the full, the band would be behind him. You, you, uh, excuse me. You kind of have to also train for lack of a better phrase, sorry. You kind of have to train your folks who are on the platform with your uh, pastor or whoever's giving announcements or whoever's key speaker to really keep the mindset of always be smiling because you never know when you're going to be on camera and, um, and facial expressions are critical. So if you disagree with something that's going on and you make a face, you best be careful because it'll either be on camera or it'll be on recording or someone will see it. So I spent a lot of time convincing leadership that this is a key factor. You have to understand you at any minute, the camera could be on you, whether you know it or not. So having someone in the background of the shot is is inevitable. Um, and with the right coaching and the right understanding that, hey, we are on camera, we are live, we are recorded whichever way, all of that means is this is going to be recorded and somebody's going to see it. And most likely it's going to be on the internet. So you're going to be out there. So always be smiling. Don't make faces. Um, Cause you know, facial expressions can say a lot. And, um, and uh, in, in your particular case, uh, Chelsea, um, you know, I'm assuming your choir is wearing robes. But um, well, they're not with COVID. They had okay. been, um, okay. but just as far as you know, even as I, as we sit on the Zoom call and you watch people's faces, typically when we listen, we just don't really even have an expression on our face. Mm -hmm. So we need to help them be like active listeners, where right. they're almost reacting right. silently. Right. Yeah. Um, so, but where I was going to tie in with that, I agree with you. That's that's uh, even coaching them to just be you know, blank is kind of important. Um, and this, uh, I'm going to go ahead and step on this topic and uh, I will ask for, for grace if this sounds a bit picky. Um, this is also the area where I would strongly stress with leadership of my church over, we need to make sure anyone on the platform understands appropriate attire and, and presentation uh, on the stand up on the platform. If they're going to be anywhere near the camera shot, or even if they're not, if they're going to be on the platform, they're representing this church and they need to be a properly dressed um, in appropriate clothing to tight clothing. Um, I hate to say this too, non flattering clothing. Um, but in the area of clothing, as far as also from a technical standpoint, you don't want someone wearing a super busy sweater or shirt because your camera typically has a hard time with it and it will look like some uh, focus pattern half of the time on on the recording or on the live stream so it's important for people to pay attention to that and if, you know i'll say that too from from the standpoint and from my experience at pcc we shot on this platform once the message started the room went dark and just the platform was lit where the, the speaker was. So you take someone wearing a black shirt into that environment where they're shooting a video against a dark or black background, you then suddenly become hands and face floating in the air. Uh, opposite of that, they can't wear white because as soon as the lights hit them, they glow. You know, it just, it's the technical standpoint. Now in a well-lit room, you probably won't have that scenario. And as many of your churches, I'm going to assume from, you know, some of the ones I've been checking in, you're not going to have that issue. You fall back to make sure you're dressed appropriately for being on the platform, representing this church in front of a camera. Um, you know, and that's always a delicate conversation to have, no matter what church you're at. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I hope that answered your question. It, it did. It helped. Yes. Anyone else? All right. Well, my next area topic, and this one, this one we can we can talk a little bit longer because this is a very uh, popular topic right now, and it's one all of us are trying to figure out 
it's the area of creating an online small group. Uh, and now you may call them Sunday school, you may call them small groups, life groups, whatever, whatever your individual church's designation is for it. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to continue to use a small group because that's what basically I've always known them as. Um, at PCC, at least, we call them small groups, six, eight, ten people, typically. Um, and we started online small groups before COVID hit. And um, it was, uh, it was kind of initially before COVID, it was kind of a difficult to launch because nobody was just like, well, I prefer getting together in person. Well, yeah, I get that. You know, and then COVID hit and guess what? Everybody's trying to launch an online small group um, because, you know, you're trying to social distance and, and be safe. And, you know, all of us have figured out, I'm assuming, I shouldn't say all, excuse me. Most of us have probably figured out doing small groups through Zoom just like this um, is safe. It's actually easier. You still get to have face-to-face uh, -face time with people in your group. Uh, the benefit here too is a uh, platform like Zoom is protected. So you can still have conversations that stay within your group. Um, so, you know, from that aspect, it's been, uh, it's been a learning curve for everybody. And it's one I hope that people will continue to use. Um, one of the things when I started trying to launch my small groups through the online campus uh, I actually reached out to a gentleman by the name of Jake Randa, and he is the online pastor. I think his title's changed now, but I, I haven't had a chance to check in with him and see what it is now. But he is with Saddleback Church, and they are the one church that I'm aware of who has a huge online presence. They're an on, uh, online mega church, uh, Rick Warren's church. And I did check in with him just recently and um, about a month ago. And at that point in time, he had over 2,000 online small groups. And I have asked him many times over the years, I'm like, what's the secret? Because I mean, I was lucky to get two going. I can't imagine making 2,000. Um, and his answer to me was, he said, it's actually quite simple. He said that the energy is spent in finding, promoting, supporting individuals who want to lead a small group. He said, once you find them, then you, you give them whatever tools they need to get it done. And it comes down to you let them pick whatever platform they want to use. Don't limit them. If so, he has folks using all different types of platforms. Um, we actually, so I experimented with that. So, you know, almost everybody's tried a Facebook group. Um, and those actually, typically they start off really well. Um, they don't seem to have longevity though. Uh, I know we launched about a dozen different Facebook groups for small groups and it starts off great. And then it just kind of slowly, conversation slowly fades away. Um, so, you know, but if you find one that works great, keep, keep going with it. Um, so then we had a group, uh, I don't know if any of y'all know or have heard of the application called Marco Polo. Uh, which is an app, cell phone app, at least for us it is. <laughs> I haven't found one that found that it works on your laptop. Uh, it probably does, but I haven't found it. So they would do Marco Polo, little video chats with each other. And so the, the lead of the group would say, hey, here's a topic. Let's talk about this. And everybody could chime in through video chat, actually quite successfully. Um, to the point that that was so popular, our entire leadership jumped into using Marco Polo for <laughs> general communications between each other. Um, so, you know, it's different, different tools for what works. Uh, we had, uh, Jay Cranda told me he had youth ministries that were using completely different platforms that the kids were using most of the time. Um, some of them, which I'd never heard of. Uh, and I'm like, there's just too many options out there. I'll, I will cross that bridge when we get a little more focused for our youth group. But it's a, it's a key factor of saying, I will give you content. I will give you supporting documents. You pick your platform that you want to try and try it. If it works, great. 
Um, if it doesn't, all right, let's pick a different one. Let's try something else. So just before leaving PCC, I had, uh, I had one individual who had started two different online small groups and they had been extremely successful. And in fact, I teased her many times because one of the groups was no longer small. It was like 30, 40 people. And, uh, but we'd continue to call it a small group. This is because what we called it. But her, her structure was she did Zoom platform once a week. And then she partnered it with a Facebook page, a Facebook group, excuse me. And she used Facebook as her daily conversations back and forth to support documents. Like, you know, she would attach study guides. She'd attach a link to the videos for, the, uh, for that week's conversation. And they would, tr they would do more conversation over Facebook. And then if she needed to, she could schedule an additional Zoom session if the group wanted to have one, another get together and let's really talk about something. Uh, it has turned out to be highly successful uh, pairing those two together. So, you know, that, that's where it jumps back to like what Jay Cranda told me, you know, Saddleback has 15 locations in California. They have four locations outside the continental U.S. They have an online campus and over 2,000 online small groups. Uh, and that's just their online groups. They're not counting their physical small groups. So again, it, it comes back to finding the leaders, giving them tools, and then seeing how they develop with it. And no idea is a bad idea. Um, try it out. If it's successful, keep going with it and try to replicate it. Tom, what kind of training do you do or helping or nurturing the people that say that they'll do it? Um, so typically... Uh, what I have done in the past, and this this was uh, this was actually how I was trained by at PCC as one of the pastors. You would um, you know less than once a year, so you know like January February, you would launch a new group, and you would launch it from the standpoint of start picking people to be in your group, one who you ultimately want to take over and have that person lead your group. And then you would be part of the group for the first 30, 60 days. And, while, and, and the whole time you make it clear, I'm mentoring this person. This person's going to end up being the lead of this group. And you get to that point and you pass the reins. Um, one of the things we did, which was um, at PCC, which was beneficial to us, uh, shortly after I launched relaunched the online campus I went to our teaching team and I said can you start developing a study guide worksheet to go with your sermons each week and we will use that to feed the small groups uh, specifically at that time it was for the online small groups it ended up becoming a key factor for all of our small groups at PCC so uh they agreed. They thought it was a great idea. And then, uh, and now they still are doing this. We actually uh, would record a, a follow-up video and a study guide sheet every week that tied in with every message each week. That became the materials that would feed small groups. Now, with that being said, your small group leaders also had the choice of picking whatever topic, whatever media they wanted to use. They didn't have to tie to the pieces at church. But that's how we, that's how I was trained. That's how we were doing uh, seeding and launching new small groups. Another resource for a lot of small groups now is Right Now Media. I don't know if anybody else uses them. PCC used it a lot. Great resource. Did you check in with them, say, a couple of times um, just to see what issues they were having? Mm -hmm. Or did they normally, or did they normally just come to you automatically because, because you had been in contact with them before? A little bit of both. Um, you know, most of the ones who I had helped them take over a group, I would follow up with um, just to say, hey, how's it going? Um, in the realm of an online small group, um, when we first launched them, we, like I said, I always try to, whatever platform they are on, I always try to lead them to pair it with a Facebook group 
and make me part of that group so that I could just come in, not that I was being nosy, but I could just come in and see how the group looks like they're doing conversation wise. I could, I could still step in. And if for whatever reason, if that individual who was leading was not able to be there and there wasn't someone else in the group who was going to take the lead, I could step in. Sure. Let me um, interrupt for a minute. We've got about five more minutes. What I want to do before, so I don't forget about this, is that um, we've already talked to Tom. And if you have a group, um, a small group, and he's going to talk about that also just for a second, I hope, about starting a group that would do this in your church. Like, how do you start a ministry that's more than just this with, with possibly just two other people? Um, we will have, if you put together a group like that, let us know and within the next, say, four to six weeks, because I know you can't enlist everybody just on the spot, but we'll have a second training. Tom will do a second training for those that are part of that ministry group. All right. So Tom, you want to, uh, do you all have other questions right now? Cause I want to give you a chance to ask anything. We're, we're going to stop pretty much on time, but okay, David. Uh, yeah, I would love to um, pick your brain just a little bit about how you um, are able to establish some connections, particularly with uh, guests who pop into your live stream. You know, I'm sure all of us would say that one of the hardest tasks is getting any contact information from somebody who's physically in our building. Uh, the only thing that might be harder would be establishing any kind of personal connection with people then who visit us digitally. So. It, it, what have you found that maybe gave you a toehold in that? Okay. There are actually two uh, approaches right now that a lot of online churches are looking at and taking. Um, most churches, if you are live streaming or, or what they also call sim live streaming, which is a pre-record that you schedule a broadcast time for, most of your site's software uh, will allow you to, uh, if you have a chat window, if you have uh, that feature where they'll be able to chat with you, have the capability for people to, uh, if they want to chat, they have to sign in, which means you've captured their contact information. Um, it, some people are turned off by that. And a lot of times, for the longest time, I did not have that when, uh, when, when PCC would uh, open, we, we did not force sign-ins. But it is a useful tool. Uh, to allow you to capture who logged in, who was talking, you know, and all that stuff. Excuse me. Um, from the other side of the fence, if you don't force that piece, capturing that detail is difficult unless they offer it up. And um, so it all depends on how you want to approach it. I mean, even some of the big, big online churches, Life Church, you can't chat unless you create a profile. They force it, and that's fine. Um, I've discovered now over the time that it doesn't seem to be as big an issue as I felt like it was. So, you know, asking for some information for them to be able to, to talk is I think acceptable. Um, and plus the other key factor, and, and I'm gonna touch on what Jim referenced, you know, building a team, building an online team is important. Um, and this was the one area, this will tie back to your question, David, as well. Um, this is the one area that I, I failed when I launched, relaunched the online campus for PCC. I did not spend the energy to build my team soon enough. I took too long to build my team. So for the first six to 12 months that we had PCC online campus open, I was the team. I was it. I ran all of it. And one, that's physically exhausting, but two, it's difficult to be able to focus on all the pieces that you need. At minimum, two people, in my opinion, two people is what you really need to launch an online, online campus. Now, if that's where you're gonna go, that's what you should do. If you just wanna improve your current presence, then you know, we'll talk about how that flows. Um, 
But for me, being the online pastor, my focus was supposed to be providing pastoral care to those folks online. Uh, I had the online presence. We were broadcasting live. I had a chat window. So the second role was a chat host. And the best comparison I can give you to describe who a chat host is, think about it as your front door greeter. Someone who says hello when people come in the door to your building. Just a little bit more complex because these people are going to be talking to folks coming in to the chat window. They're going to be outside of your online pastor. They're going to be your representatives of your church to the people uh, watching and chatting <laughs> online. So it's important that they understand the protocols, the, the, this may not be a proper phrase, but someone I've always learned the DNA of your church. They need to be good, solid representatives of your church uh, when you're picking a chat host. So those folks, those chat hosts are the key folks who go like, hey, I've seen this person log in the last three Sundays, start trying to make communications with them, maybe really push them to say, hey, could you fill out a welcome card and let us know you were here and start collecting your data that way. Um, so long story to get back to an answer, David. I think if you actually do push um, for people to create a profile to chat, uh, it's, a, it's a tremendous thing. A few of the platforms out there, if you pay for the premium service, they automatically capture the, uh, re the, the source of where people are, are connecting to you from down to the point that you can actually capture uh, emails. Um, I never went that far because honestly, I couldn't afford to pay <laughs> for that level of service. But there are ways around asking for it and still getting what you're looking for. It just may be too pricey. Okay, thank you. Um, you're welcome. Tom, I appreciate it. Um, are there any other last minute questions? Like I said, if you, if you are gonna go to the next step and put together um, a team like what he was talking about, we'll go ahead and, and have uh, some training for you. We're not, gonna, we're not gonna provide that training until we know that it's needed, all right? So if, if you are going to put together a team, just, just let me know and let me know how it's coming. And then, as I've said before, we're already talking to Tom about scheduling something, I don't know, maybe two months out, six weeks out, you know, whatever, uh, that would work for you all and your teams. And then what this would be is more directed to the, how they're going to actually do that within their own, with their church. And what I would do with that is I would ask for questions to begin with and then let Tom deal with that. And then on top of that, his experience. So anything else? We're glad to see you all. We really, really are. Uh, as Brenda has been saying, Brenda's sort of um, been the host as you've been uh, seeing in the chat. And we appreciate that, Brenda. Thank you, Brenda. Um, um, so we appreciate it all. We look forward to being able to be in contact with you. Uh, if there are, <clears throat> if there are other questions, Tom, you want to, uh, give them your uh, contact information. We'll also sure. put that in the notes as well. All right. So, so you can, you can email me at tom.lewis, it's L-E-W-I-S, at omc-va.com. Thanks so much. Take care. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.